Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to be looking at the loop of Henle and its role in maintaining osmoregulation in the kidney. We are going to focus specifically on structures and how they do their jobs. But if you are looking for the sodium potassium pump explanation, that is in a separate video because it requires a little bit more detail than I'm going to include in this introduction to how the loop of Henley does its job. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed because I post every Tuesday and Thursday for grade 10 to 12 life sciences. If you are in grade 11 and you're thinking about improving your marks before exams and tests, you should also think about getting a copy of my cheat sheet study guide, which is available on missangler.co.za. It covers all the year's worth of work. It makes learning and studying so easy and easy to remember for those exams. So let's get into the video now. And I want to just recap some of the things we've already gone over, starting off with the nephron, which we are looking at right now. In previous videos, we would have covered what happens over here in the glomerulus, which is glomerular filtration. We then also had a video on the proximal convoluted tubule, where we looked at um, reabsorption of nutrients. And now what we're going to focus on is this region down here, the loop of Henle. And the loop of Henle has a really important process called osmoregulation. But before we get into osmoregulation, there's a couple of things I want to explain to you first so that you understand them really, really well. Now, to fully understand osmoregulation or the regulation of water in the loop of Henle, we actually need some diffusion or osmosis knowledge. And we need to unpack the word osmolarity because I'm going to use it quite regularly through this explanation. And I need you to understand what it means. So essentially, when we talk about osmolarity, we are talking about the solutes, which in this case is often salts and how many there are dissolved in the liquid. In other words, does it have a high solute? And if it has a high solute, that means it has high osmolarity. So that's how those two things work together. And so osmolarity refers to the solute content. Now, if we use this little um, diffusion diagram below, um, touching in on our grade 10 knowledge, what we look at here is we've taken some dye and we have um, dropped it into a beaker of water. Now, this region over here where there is a lot of dye particles, this is technically an area of high osmolarity. In other words, the, there is a high concentration of our dye molecules versus this area over here which would have a low osmolarity. Now, why is this important to know high and low osmolarity? Well, through the laws of diffusion and osmosis, substances are always going to move from a high to a low. And we can see that in the second diagram over here, our dye particles are slowly diffusing throughout the space until eventually they eat equal a dynamic equilibrium, or it basically means that we have an even distribution of water to dye. Now, how does this factor into the loop of Henle? Well, the loop of Henle runs on osmolarity. In other words, making water move depending on where the solute concentration is. Now, the other thing that we must remember when we speak about osmolarity is when we talk about the water movement, we talk about it as osmosis. And osmosis is water moving passively. The thing is, water moves passively, but solutes don't move passively. They move actively. In other words, they need energy to move. Now, we are going to talk more about this active movement in the sodium-potassium pump Instead, we're going to just focus in on the general idea of how we move water out of the loop of Henle using the idea of osmolarity, that solutes are going to try and distribute themselves 
and they're always going to move from a high to a low. Now, one of the things that we must not forget that we also learned in grade 10 was the words hypotonic and hypertonic. And so I'm just going to go over them again. If a solution is hypertonic, what that means is it has a high amount of solutes and a low amount of water. Now, together, this indicates to me that the osmolarity is high. How do I know it's high? Well, osmolarity, remember, is linked to the amount of solutes. So if there is a high amount of solutes, there is a high amount of osmolarity. If a solution is hypotonic, this means that there is a low level of solutes and a high level of water. And we would describe this situation as being a low osmolarity. Now that we have a basic understanding of what osmolarity is, we can now apply it to osmoregulation. Now, osmoregulation is the way in which the loop of Henle regulates how much water but also how much salt is in the bloodstream. And so we've got to remember that when we talk about osmoregulation, we're not just talking about regulating water, we're also talking about regulating salt. Now, some anatomy breakdown on this loop of Henle is that the left-hand side of the loop of Henle is what we call the descending limb, which is the side that's going down. And on the right-hand side here, we have the ascending limb, which is the side of the loop of Henle going up. And so essentially what's happening is the filtrate is entering at the top here and exiting on the other side on the ascending bit. Now for me to explain osmolarity and what's actually happening very well here, I'm going to use some numbers to try and explain what's happening. I want you to know that these numbers are not specific, they are arbitrary, I'm, I'm making them up so that I can explain this idea to you. So what are these numbers? Well, let's say the filter enters at the top of the tube here and the filtrate has a concentration level of 300. What does that represent? That represents the osmolarity of the filtrate, of the fluid. It starts off at 300, and as we go down, it becomes 600, then 900, and in the middle here, it is now 1,200. Now, this represents the concentration, and you'll notice it's getting more concentrated. The main thing I want you to take away from here is that I'm not adding any extra salts to make it more concentrated. I'm actually taking water away. So what's happening is water is leaving the loop of Henle as we go down until we get to the bottom here when it's at its highest point, and water is leaving. And this is because the descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water. Now, what does that mean, permeable? We've forgotten. Permeable means substances can move through it. Now, water is permeable, which means it's leaving. And the only way I can describe this to you in like an everyday example would be like, imagine you made a glass of Oros juice. You put too much water in. Now you want to take the water out. Hypothetically, that is actually possible where you can take the water out and you can make it more concentrated again. You would do this by like dehydrating the, the concentration, removing the water. Now that means the descending limb is permeable to water, but it is not permeable to salts. In other words, salts cannot leave, or solutes cannot leave on the descending limb. So that means as the filtrate moves down through the descending limb, its osmolarity is increasing, it's getting higher. Now to fully understand this, we need to also know one other important piece of information, and that is that the loop of Henle is actually divided into two 
zones. The left-hand zone is permeable to water, and the tissues around the loop of Henle, they are hypertonic. Whereas the solutions on the right-hand side are hypotonic. Now, again, this is important to know because if you've learned anything from grade 10, you will know that solutions that are hypertonic are high in solutes, salts in this instance, which is going to attract the water out of the loop of Henle so that it will enter the surrounding tissue. On the other hand, on the ascending side, we have a solution that's sitting around the loop of Henle that is hypotonic. Now, because it's hypotonic, it means the water levels are high and the salt levels are low. Now, this is where it gets interesting. When we look at the ascending limb, the limb that's going up in the loop of Henle, we will notice that the numbers start to decrease again. And by quite a lot. Now, what's interesting on this side is we are now actually not moving any water this time around. We are actually moving solutes or salts. So what's coming out on this side is going to be all of your solutes like sodium and uh, chloride, potassium. They are all leaving on this side of the loop of Henle. And that is because the ascending side of the loop of Henle is permeable to salts, but it is not permeable to water. Now, this is very interesting, and I know you're probably sitting here thinking, okay, so one side lets water out, and the other side lets salt out. Yes, that is what is happening. Now, why do we do it that way? Well, we have to maintain a concentration gradient. We always have to be moving water from a high concentration in the tube to a low concentration outside the tube into the surrounding tissue and eventually into the bloodstream. Now, the only way to do that is to consistently put salts out of the loop of Henle. So what I'm saying is where we drew here in green, these are all the salts that are leaving. And they leave so much so that even on the other side, they start to drift into this area over here. And now this area here becomes salty. And this area here and all around here becomes salty. Hence the description of hypertonic. And as we learned before, water goes wherever salt goes. So if the area is salty, water will follow. I want to also say that this section is very difficult and there is a lot of moving pieces to osmoregulation. What we are going to do in the upcoming video for sodium potassium pump is I'm going to go over this again and actually show you how does the salt get out of the tube that then makes the surrounding tissue salty, which then attracts the water. I'm going to clarify that for you. So if you're still not so certain, I suggest you go on to watch that video next. Now, as always, I like to finish off my lessons with a terminology recap, and you can use all of these terms to create flashcards with. Starting off with the terminology around the actual physical structure of the loop of Henle, we have the descending limb and the ascending limb. The descending limb is the limb that is going down and the ascending means it's going up. It is important to know that it's not just about the names, but also what happens in each. Remember, in the descending limb, we are going to absorb water only back into the blood, whereas the ascending limb is only going to be able to absorb salt back into the surrounding tissue. And in doing so, it allows for water to then also leave as well. Now, speaking of salt and water, we can't not speak about osmolarity. Osmolarity is the amount of solutes that are in a liquid. In other words, it references the concentration.
And osmolarity is really important when it comes to maintaining the water level in the bloodstream, particularly in the loop of Henle. Osmolarity is linked to osmoregulation because if there is a high osmolarity in the blood, which means the blood is very salty, we need to put more water out of the loop of Henle and back into the bloodstream. Speaking of that, the only way we are able to get blood into the bloodstream is through permeability. And something that is permeable means it allows substances to move through it. Remember earlier that the descending limb is permeable to water, but not to salt, whereas the ascending limb is permeable to salt, but not to water. Because they have opposite functions, the one limb allows the other limb to do its job much better. Why? Because wherever salt goes, water follows. Which brings me to the word osmoregulation. It is the regulation of water through salts. And a lot of people don't understand that you have to regulate the salt first before you can regulate water. It's also important to go and watch my video on how ADH and aldosterone function as they are the two main hormones that regulate water and regulate salt, and those videos are already up on my playlist. Last but not least, the words hypotonic and hypertonic. Hypotonic refers to a solution that is low in solutes but high in water. Hypertonic means that the solution is high in solutes but low in water. Now, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And I'll see you all again soon. Bye.